Good evening. Uh, welcome, everyone, to tonight's talk, Beyond Earth, Our Future in Space, which is brought to you as part of the university's Island of Ideas public talk series. So today we're meeting and broadcasting from Lutruida, Tasmania, Aboriginal land, sea, and waterways. As a reflection of our institution's recognition of the deep history and culture of this island, the university wishes to acknowledge the traditional owners of Lutruida, Tasmania, the Palawa people. The Palawa are the original and traditional custodians of Nipaluna, Hobart, the land from which we're broadcasting today. We pay our respect to elders past, present, and emerging, and those who did not make elder status. We acknowledge their deep history of storytelling, knowledge sharing, and caring for the land. So we've gathered here today to share ideas beneath the mountain Kunanyi and to talk about the skies as they once did. And I, I think it's particularly fitting to do so in the knowledge that astronomy is the oldest science and the traditional owners of this land were the first astronomers. We acknowledge the history of a people who closely and carefully observed the skies, not as a hobby or as a, a sideline to their uh, lives, but to inform their navigation, uh, critical seasonal patterns, movements of people and of animals. Their knowledge, handed down through generations, spans the complete entirety of human existence. We stand for a future that respects and acknowledges Aboriginal perspectives, culture, language, and history, and the continued effort to fight for Aboriginal justice and rights, paving the way for a strong future. My name is Andrew Cole. I'll be acting as the MC for tonight's proceedings and coordinating the Q&A session. I am an astronomer, and I'm professor of physics at the University of Tasmania, currently the head of physics, and the director of the UTAS Green Hill Observatory. On behalf of the University of Tasmania, I would like to welcome you all, whether you're joining us in person or from the comfort of your living room. It's a pleasure to share this discussion on the deep links between Tasmania and the future in what you might be tempted to call islands in the sky. The Island of Ideas series began in 2020 as a way of fostering connections between our communities and ideas when we were unable to host face-to-face -face events, sharing a knowledge uh, sharing knowledge and innovations to solve problems is a really important part of university culture. And so is the consideration of the future of problem solving so that potential problems can be anticipated before they are, uh, actually arrive. The university doesn't limit these conversations to our teaching spaces and to our corridors. Uh, we have these discussions uh, across borders and across waterways, which is uh, really uh, cool, it's a small opportunity that arose from an otherwise really deeply challenging and disruptive uh, kind of global pandemic. So the Island of Ideas program continues in the hope that we can continue to connect ideas and people of Tasmania to a global network of collaborators and thinkers so we can work uh, together to create a better future. Beyond Earth, our future in space is about uh, the rapidly changing, really important area of human activities off the surface of the planet. And you might think of space as a distant object of ivory tower study without a lot of immediate practical impact. But I think tonight's speakers will show that, on the contrary, space already plays a really important role in modern life, much more than you might uh, already think. And it's only set to expand further in the decades to come. So space has always been an object of fascination for culture, arts, humanities, and fundamental scientific inquiry. And we're now deep into an era where space will play a central role in human economic development and health. There is an incredible local pool of talent available in Tasmania, and our distinct location can be a natural advantage for discussions about space. So we have three experts here tonight. Our first speaker is an astrophysicist, the University of Tasmania's Dean of the School of Natural Sciences. He started his exploration of space as a student here. Professor Simon Ellingson is now the academic leader of the university's activities in spacecraft tracking and space domain awareness. His major areas of research are in the formation of high mass stars and the distance scale of the Milky Way galaxy, which rely on the technical expertise he developed here in understanding the physics of light emission and absorption by molecules in space, and also on the university's world-class radio astronomy infrastructure. Simon modified the antenna control system of the university's radio telescopes to allow them to support the tracking of low Earth orbit objects, and has been working with research and industry partners 
to enable uh, unique sovereign space domain awareness capabilities. Please welcome Simon Ellingson. Uh, thank you, Andrew, um, and uh, thank you for that um, amazing introduction to our topic tonight. So space is a topic which I always uh, love to talk about, and it's a, it's a real privilege to be able to sort of share some of those experiences with you tonight. Um, so the image that we have here before us, um, many of you will recognise, um, I just did a quick Google the other day, a few weeks ago, we were able to witness, or many of us were able to witness, the amazing, spectacular um, sight of the Aurora Australis. Um, we've already heard tonight of Tasmania's first people as some of the first astronomers. And over the many millennia um, that they've inhabited this place, they would have had the ability to see these many, many times. Um, one of the things that I'd be really fascinated to know, and one of the great things about being able to talk to a broad audience is, I have not heard any particular stories of Aboriginal knowledge related to um, Aurora and things like that. Now, they must be there, um, and it would be fascinating to know what some of those are. So if anyone does have some information on that, I would love to hear it afterwards. One of the things that um, this image also highlights is one of the other aspects that Andrew touched on, which is the uniqueness of Tasmania. So those of us who live here know how unique and how special the place is, but I don't think many people actually realise just how special it is in terms of some of our astronomical and sky phenomena. So in order to see aurora, such as we see in, here in Tasmania, you typically have to go to much more northern or much more southern latitudes. It happens to be one of those uh, happy coincidences of nature that at the current time in Earth's history, the location of the geomagnetic South Pole is actually much closer to Tasmania than the physical South Pole. And in fact, it's closer to Tasmania than any other particular landmass. So we actually get better aurora in Tasmania than they do in the southern part of New Zealand, which you might think is really not that far away on global scales. Now, the reason I bring that up is not just to, to brag to those of you who aren't here that we get really good aurora, but it's also because that coincidence, that uh, freak of nature that currently occurs, has also been pivotal in terms of the history of the study of astronomy, astrophysics, and hence space here in Tasmania. So the location of the geomagnetic pole means that this was also a great place to do low frequency radio astronomy. Um, and that was really what started, I guess, the modern history of studies of space here in Tasmania, that along with the study of cosmic rays, which of course uh, the aurora are associated with. So one of the things that it's always hard to wrap your head around, being a little human stuck here on Earth, is the scale of space. So one of the things I guess I'd like you to think about at the moment is where does space actually start? So if you go and sort of Google it and look at um, things like international conventions, Space nominally is listed as starting 100 kilometres above the Earth's surface. So if you are able to get in your car and drive straight up, it would take you about an hour to get to space um, at highway driving speed. So really, space is not very far away. Now, there's two things that I guess I'd like people to think about in that context, and one is you don't even have to drive anything like 100 kilometres before the environment becomes inhospitable to human life. All right. We know that eight kilometres up on the top of Mount Everest, it's pretty challenging for people to survive. So when you think about that and you think about the scale of the globe, the amount of the universe that is currently compatible with human life is very, very small. And so one of the things that it's incumbent upon us to do is to really remember that and to look after this bit of the universe that we can currently live in. Because while space is big, um, getting to other parts where human life could be readily supported is hard. The other thing is, is if we think about the people in the International Space Station, they're about 430 kilometres above some bit of the Earth at the moment. So that's really not very far away at all. Um, when you think about it, we think of them as being a long way away, and indeed they're relatively isolated. The other aspect, though, is back a little over 50 years ago, we sent the first people to another astronomical body. We sent the first people to the moon in 1969. That is 150,000 kilometres away. So while the International Space Station is indeed being in space, 
Humans have actually explored out to 150,000 kilometres as, uh, as people, and we're looking to go much further in the not too distant future. But that is a phenomenally long distance away, and that's only the moon. Um, so space is enormous, space is very big, a lot of potential, but also a lot of things to um, get in the way, a long way from uh, help. So sometimes people think of space as being somewhat esoteric, uh, the sort of thing that you do as a, a leisure activity or things like that. But one of the things that is important to recognise is, as Andrew mentioned, the growing importance of space in our everyday life. So five years ago, 2018, um, Australia launched its, its space agency. And at the time, that was treated with a degree of levity by some people. Um, we had the, the Australian Research Space Exploration Agency sort of put up as a bit of a spoof site. You know, and it's all very fine to, you know, you know, treat these things with a bit of levity. We can't be too serious about everything. But it really does ignore the fact that if space activity was to help halt tomorrow, it would have a dramatic impact on the lives of every person here in this room, every person on Zoom, and the rest of the world as well. Um, for all sorts of communications, safety, and other reasons, we rely on space all the time, every day. It's really not a luxury activity, it's part of our, um, the requirements for our modern society. Furthermore, although Australia really doesn't have much presence in terms of having objects in space at the moment, we're one of the most space-dependent nations on Earth. Now, again, that comes as a bit of surprise to some people, but the reason is actually pretty obvious when you think about it. We're a large country with a relatively small population, very geographically dispersed. So when we need to deliver services away from our major capital cities, it's much more efficient to use space and space technologies than it is to run a physical road, a physical cable, a physical fibre. And we've become very good at doing that, but one of the challenges around that is that a lot of what we rely on has actually been provided by our friends in other countries. And one thing that the last few years has taught us is that you can't always rely on your friends to be there when really bad things happen. So it's important that Australia improves and develops its own sovereign capabilities in space because there may come a time when we're going to need those. And so the Australian Space Agency was really set up in order to try and help and facilitate that, to recognise that. And it's important to also realise that space is changing very rapidly. So for most of the first 50 or 60 years of space exploration, it's been very much the realm of big government. It's been NASA, it's been ESA, it's been JAXA, it's been Roscosmos, you know, the big government agencies which have been putting things up there and also military activity. But in the last 10 or so years, there's been much more commercial activity in space. And that's been driven by the fact that we can launch objects much more readily and cheaply than we used to be able to. So SpaceX, Rocket Labs and other companies have really broken that barrier. And Mars is going to talk more about some of the challenges that some of those changes have created. So one of the other points that it's worth making in terms of when we discuss space and how we want to understand space is really people think space, they think rocket launches. That's part of going to space, but in reality, in terms of what it means economically, that's actually a very, very small part. So a few years ago, 2019, the global space economy was about 350 billion. And of that 350 billion, 1.1 billion was launches. All right? And a tiny fraction was humans going to space. Most of the economic activity facilitated and driven by space are things like our positioning systems, the GPSs which we have on our phones, and how that enables and makes all sorts of things possible. Things like TV and communications, they're actually the main things which go on in space in terms of uh, making our lives better and helping us to um, or live in our general everyday situations. Now, here in Tasmania, we do a whole range of things related to space, and one of those is in association with 
our positioning systems. So one of the things that, again, many people are probably not aware of is that the most accurately known location in Tasmania is um, a certain point on this particular instrument. So this is our Mount Pleasant 26 metre antenna. And this image, which was uh, shot a few years ago, this little time lapse, shows that antenna participating in an experiment. Now, that experiment is part of Australia's contribution to the global position navigation and timing system. So in order to keep the GPS on your phone accurate, we actually have to measure how the Earth sits in space. Now, you may not realise it, but the length of every day is slightly different. And the Earth actually wobbles a little bit around. And the GPS satellites and other GNSS constellations which are out there are not affected by that wobbling of the Earth. So if we don't measure those little changes in how the Earth spins over a period of a few months, your navigation system gets less accurate. Now, if you're only using your GPS to find um, the nearest toilet or McDonald's or something like that, that's probably okay. If it gets inaccurate by a few metres, you can still probably find your way there. But if you're using that to um, do some precision agriculture in your field um, and you don't want to run through your irrigation line, or if you're using it to help mine a seam of ore and things like that, then you really want these things to be accurate to centimetres. And you actually need to correct and make account for these on a regular basis. And the University of Tasmania is part of that global network which, using observations of the distant stars, is able to make those measurements and make those corrections. And so contribute something like $12 billion to the Australian economy, or sorry, plays a part in $12 billion worth of economic activity within the Australian economy. The other area where we are increasing our capability and increasing our work is in spacecraft and satellite tracking. So our 26 metre antenna has been capable of tracking low Earth orbit satellites for a couple of decades. Um, and a couple of years ago, we were fortunate enough to receive a grant from the Australian Space Agency to construct a new dedicated ground tracking antenna, one which can move much more quickly. So the 7.3 metre antenna, which is at the University of Tasmania's Green Hill Observatory, this is a little time lapse uh, of it being constructed. Um, we opened it earlier this year. And the role of this antenna is to work with Australian industry, Australian researchers in making it possible to access data from space more readily. So one of the ways in which Tasmania can benefit from the growing space industry and going space uh, activity is through access for data in space. So our primary producers, our farmers, our people doing forestry and agriculture, monitoring land, monitoring land usage, understanding how things are changing is of significant value. And getting better access to that data is one of the things that these new infrastructure facilitate. And what we really need to be doing, one of the options we have, is to be working together to see how we can do that in new and interesting and innovative ways. So we have an opportunity in front of us in terms of what is going on in space. Um, in the same way that the internet disrupted a lot of business, a lot of um, our activities 20 or 30 years ago, space is a new opportunity for those disruptive technologies, those new ideas, those new ways of doing things. Tasmania is in a great place to be able to be at the forefront of some of that work, partly through our infrastructure that we have access to, partly through our geography. Being quite far south, we actually have better access to a lot of the Earth observation satellites than many places in Australia do. Um, and also being an island, we talk about our island laboratory. We have the ability to essentially develop and trial things here on our island, which if they work well, you can then export them in other places. But it's an opportunity that we really have to look to moving towards quickly because, you know, this is not a secret. The fact that we're going to be making much more use of space and that this is an important area for economic activity, lots of people know it. So if we sit back, will be in the situation where we're importing the good ideas from other places 
and employing them here and paying other people for their expertise and their intellectual property. So it's important that we seize this opportunity as best we can, look for where we can do new and unique things. And so that's really a, a call to, you know, to arms for everyone around here. Um, talk to your friends, talk to the people you know, think about what things that we can do because there are many different ideas that we and ways we can apply it. And it's really a matter for us to try and find those and explore them. Some of them would be dumb, but some of them would be genius. And so we've got to find those, those gems. So one of the things that we've been doing at the University of Tasmania is looking for where we have those great opportunities. And there are a couple of areas where it's very clear that we have a, a unique opportunity. Part of it, I said before, is geography. One of the really nice things about space is that the important events which happen in space missions you can't plan them to happen above a particular country in general, or if you do, it restricts everything else about the mission. So, you know, when the next people land on the moon, the moon will be somewhere. It'll be over some part of the earth, and it probably won't be over the particular country that's uh, landing the mission. In the same way that those of you who've seen the dish know that some of the critical uh, moments in the moon landing happened when uh, it was visible from here in Australia, that will happen in future missions. So. We need to have the ability to communicate and view the moon and other distant bodies from everywhere on the earth. So there's an opportunity for Australia to play a role there um, with instruments such as our University of Tasmania antennas. And in fact, just to put this in perspective, there are more than 250 planned lunar missions uh, in the next decade or so. Now, a lot of those probably won't happen, but even if a handful of those go ahead, that's a lot of opportunities and a lot of support. So low Earth orbit is the easy bit of space. Um, you can use smaller antennas for that. Going further away, you need bigger antennas, such as the one that I showed earlier at Mount Pleasant, and that's a great opportunity for us. That, along with um, our now improved ability to communicate and get data from our satellites. So just to set the scene for some of the, our next speakers, the other thing I'd highlight to you is how much things are changing, how quickly things are changing. So in 2018, there were a little over 2,000 active satellites in orbit. Last year, in one year alone, we launched 2,533 new satellites. So in the most recent year that just occurred, uh, we had more satellites launched than had been launched and were still active in the entire previous history of spaceflight through to 2018. So we were launching tens of new satellites a year or having tens of new active satellites a year. We're now into thousands. Now that presents a lot of challenges as well as opportunities and, and Mars is gonna talk to us more about those challenges. But there are lots of great things that we can do and it would be great to uh, share some of those ideas and hear some of the ideas that you have. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. That was a really inspirational view of Tasmania's bright future in space, and it reminded me of two, tr like one trivia fact that the Apollo program returned something like five to seven dollars to the U.S. economy for every dollar that was invested. And the other thing it reminded me of was the sheer terror of being in a small plane landing with no visibility, using just the GPS to do it. So. We're grateful for the centimeter accuracy in that circumstance. So our next speaker is the Chief Medical Officer of the Australian Antarctic Division, Chair of the Center of Antarctic Remote and Maritime Medicine, and Adjunct Associate Professor at the College of Health and Medicine. He's a remote medicine generalist and past president of the Australian College of Rural and Remote Medicine. Dr. Jeff Ayton has led the Australian Antarctic Division Polar Medicine Unit since 2002 and collaborated with NASA research programs on medicine in extreme environments. The challenges of overwinter isolation and the medical support of Australian research stations is akin to the isolation and challenge of space operations and collaboration in this environment are analogous to challenges of long duration space travel. We can also hope for some excellent firsthand insight as in 1992, he wintered at Casey Research Station as the sole Antarctic medical practitioner. Please welcome Dr. Jeff Hayden.
Thanks, Andrew, and welcome, everyone. So the Centre for Antarctic Remote and Maritime Medicine is based here, and it's a partnership between the Australian Antarctic Division, uh, which is part of the Department, Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water, and the Tasmanian Government, Department of Health and State Growth, and Menzies uh, Research Institute and the University of Tasmania. We formed that because of the longstanding relationships uh, here in Tasmania that enabled Antarctic uh, Australia's Antarctic program and the medical support requirements of that uh, going forth. So uh, that's a key partnership that we have here locally in Tasmania that uh, will highlight how we all work together here in Tasmania and some of the opportunities. And I hope to, you know, thanking Andrew uh, and uh, Simon and bring some of those links together of uh, the opportunities not only for Australia in space medicine and space uh, life sciences, but also for Tasmania. So this is from my colleague in, at NASA in the Office of Chief Health and Medical Officer, Professor Mark Schepanik, which highlights some of the human challenges of going to space. We don't have a lot of those challenges uh, in Antarctic, in the Antarctic, uh, Australia's Antarctic program, but we do have some of them. And you might be asking why, why are we dealing with uh, space medicine and, and this space analog? So some of those things that uh, we you have in space that we don't have on earth, as you know, is the issues around microgravity and fluid shifting, the muscle atrophy, uh, but we do have issues around psychological health and well-being. We do have issues around uh, bone loss where we lack in uh, solar UV radiation because we're all clothed and, we, and we're right at the bottom of the earth and we don't get to, uh, sufficient ultraviolet exposure. And we have the psychosocial risks. There's theoretical risks around cancer um, risks and immune suppression, which we'll, I'll just briefly touch on. And uh, the medical support model is also uh, uh, the, one of the key opportunities for Australia delivering into the space medicine uh, area. I asked what what relevance is this slide? Has anyone got any idea of what this is? That's a piece of wood uh, and Andy Thomas went to uh, space as a, a Australian engineer, but he, he was actually um, went on shuttle missions, but he, in recognition of Sir Douglas Mawson's uh, expeditions uh, to the Antarctic, he took two items of uh, Sir Douglas Mawson, one from the Adelaide Museum, which was Douglas Mawson's balaclava. Okay, so that piece of wood travelled over five million miles up onto into space, and it's part of Mawson's hut. So many of you would know the replica of Mawson's hut uh, down on the waterfront, and that's part of Mawson's hut. So it travelled with Sir Douglas Mawson's balaclava on the space shuttle in recognition of the expedition culture uh, that Australia brings and this uh, space medicine, space mission uh, culture. To link back to Simon's uh, thing, Mawson, it, this was, uh, Mawson went down from Hobart in 1911 to 1914 on the Australasian Antarctic Expedition to find the South Magnetic Pole, uh, South Geomagnetic Pole, and uh, which was in then at that point over Antarctica. And uh, further, uh, they left here on the sailing yacht Aurora, uh, which uh, then became the Aurora Australis um, in the Australian Antarctic program, and then uh, some uh, the latest icebreaker for the Australian Antarctic program is RSV Noyina, which um, uh, reflects the uh, link back to the um, First Nations uh, language and understanding of, of uh, the Southern Lights. Six voices got together, led by KPMG and the American Chamber of Commerce, and looked at uh, the humans living in space in 2030 and where we would be. And this is sort of an articulation of, of that. And you can see some of the aspects of the uh, space medicine opportunity that Australia has. And right in the middle there, it says telemedicine, and Australia has the opportunity to uh, uh, be an exemplar in that and because we're already doing that in Antarctica with remote and isolated environments. So that's um, key. Uh, lots of people come together around the world and highlighted some of these uh, opportunities from Tasmania. 
our Antarctic healthcare model is, is based on looking after isolated, confined, extreme uh, environments, and uh, that's the definition of that. And we have people down in Antarctica, Australians in Antarctica, currently uh, isolated for nine months of the year with no possibility of medical evacuation. So we have to provide 24-7 healthcare at a distance, and that's analogous to space. They're confined, they're highly screened, and it's an extreme environment. And I stand on the shoulders of my predecessor, Professor Des Lug, uh, who went from my position uh, to work for NASA in 2002, um, and he describes it as real people in real isolation uh, undertaking real hazardous work without hope of winter evacuation, and that's why it's a considerable analogue. We train doctors here in Australia differently from around the world. We train generalist doctors, rural and remote generalist doctors, and I did that at the Australian College of Rural and Remote Medicine is a world leader in that, and that is the scope of practice that you would expect in a in a country GP uh, in years gone by, but that's we're actually needing it more and more now, uh, that generalist scope of practice, and that's what we have uh, in our program, and that's what we train here in Tasmania and through the Australian College of Rural and Remote Medicine and, and through the Antarctic Division. To support people uh, at a distance, whether you're in space or or how we do it in Antarctica, we have this medical support model with the, with their polar medicine unit experts, my team here in, based in Kingston, and uh, the patient and the doctor at a distance down in Antarctica, and that's all connected by a, a, a digital health record, a virtual health uh, system, and it's enabled by satellites and a whole uh, swag of clever people making all this happen over vast distances, you know, four and a half thousand kilometres to the equator, to all these satellites that all comes back here and uh, I can see on my iPad or uh, whatever exactly what's happening down south. And that, supported by the Royal Hobart Hospital specialists, then can uh, allow advanced um, uh, telesurgery or advanced care down south, taking x-rays or uh, ultrasounds and, and doing what we need to do. And that could be uh, undertaking appendicitis in Antarctica. So what happens if someone gets appendicitis in, in on the way to Mars or on the moon, you know, in the Artemis missions that are proposed for the next you know, six or uh, uh, so years? You know, how do you deal with that? We NASA talks to us and says, well, what's the experience on how to deal with that? Can you have a single doctor doing a um, surgery in space. Can you have a, you know, how do you do it in Antarctica? And we train lay people um, to assist a single lone doctor and that, um, but is very challenging to do obviously in space um, with microgravity and all those sort of things. You know, I had my appendix out before I went to Antarctica for the winter and that was because I'm, there was no doctor for the doctor. So. Um, we take, you know, do you take organs from people on a long-term mission to Mars? So that's, um, and it's written up in Bush Doctors, that case. We've got significant experience here in Australia and Tasmania in the, the program. There's only been 165 person years of people in, in space, maybe a little bit more this year, um, uh, with commercial space flight and uh, uh, so on. But, you know, we've got really good data from 1989, uh, over five and a half thousand person years in an analogous environment. So can we learn from that uh, to inform those planning long-term missions? And we've been doing these expeditions from 1948. Um, and so you've got significant experience in that. One of the technology uh, is key to what we do, and it's not only key in Antarctica, but also in space and uh, in remote Australia. And this is, we implemented this 3D, 4D ultrasound. It was a laptop size. I implemented that down south in 2012. And I actually did a link to the International Space Medicine Symposium in Houston. I was in Houston and, and Glenn Browning was there at Mawson Station. And we did this link up in 2012. And that is using NASA protocols. And we also tested what happens if you weren't a doctor? Could a layperson do it? And in fact, the layperson did better than a doctor, or just slightly better because they followed instructions. Uh, <laughs> and they knew how to use the, the clicker. So where are we now 10 years later? So this is on the space station currently, and that laptop is actually now at, that's an ultrasound. 
That's the IQ butterfly ultrasound. So we implemented this in Antarctica in 2012. That connects into my iPad or my iPhone, and you can see that they've uh, flown that in the last uh, uh, two years as well onto the International Space Station. And we're working, uh, currently we've, we've got a research project in Antarctica uh, utilising these with the Translational Research Institute of Space Health, KBR, and uh, out of Houston, and uh, looking at both lay people and doctors utilising what was a $45,000 laptop is now a $3,000 ultrasound machine in your hand, which most medical students will, in the next few years, will be carrying around in the pocket like I just did. And that's what we're uh, a current research project, and they're going to be flying that on an upcoming commercial flight as well. Immune suppression, as I mentioned, is a key uh, issue in Antarctica, uh, potentially in Antarctica and in space. And we worked with uh, Bill Shearer, the doctor to the bubble boy. Um, we've had this collaboration since 1993, so a lot of work done by Des, my predecessor, and uh, it showed that um, there is a, a key. Uh, issue around immune suppression and now with COVID, you, you know, this is back in 2002-03, now you'd be all familiar with DNA and PCR tests and everything. We were doing that uh, in some of the p first PCR things back in those days with the glandular fever virus, EBV DNA on the left hand side and um, looking at your immune, at your relative immunity and you can see the, the troughs, two troughs there where you're anergic, where your immune system is stressed and right down and what happens happens is you get um, those dots going up show uh, reactivation of glandular fever virus. So you're shedding more viruses and you, know, you could apply that to COVID or other things as well. So we've also done studies with Menzies and the University of Melbourne uh, on vitamin D. And you know, we, as I explained before, we have very little exposure to solar UV down south. So we did a randomized control uh, uh, trial in space. The, your vitamin D is a lot less of an issue. You have to supply it, but the issue is around microgravity and bone, bone loss, and, but you still need the vitamin D to uh, make sure things. And Professor Kim Norris here at the School of Psychology uh, has uh, been working with us for many years and as we've published on a lot of the mental health and counselling and um, working in high-risk environments and staying cool under pressure, and those things are both analogous in Antarctica, but also in space, and uh, you know, and we're also highly relevant through the COVID isolations. And not many people will know, but uh, the Royal Hobart built a new hospital. At that time, they they had they implemented a new hyperbaric chamber, uh, with uh, takes treating diving and other um, medical illnesses that need hyperbaric oxygen or, and pressure. And uh, for a, a very minimal cost, we are able to put doors on the outside of the chamber as well. So not only can it go down to five atmospheres uh, below sea, but it can also transition all the way through um, up to uh, sea level and then up to uh, 40,000 feet uh, above sea level and then up to 100 for humans and then up to 100,000 feet uh, for non-human uh, non -human objects. So you could be testing space uh, suits in Tasmania in the not too distant future and, and Professor David Cooper and uh, Professor James Vickers are there and Alicia Tucker um, and that, that chamber uh, has a, a dual purpose uh, and is unique in the southern hemisphere. And also can answer the questions about if you have a diving injury overseas, uh, how soon can you travel after after diving? And you know, there's a delay because of the risk of bubbling um, from that from decompression sickness. So, who has been to an intensive care unit or had someone in an intensive care unit uh, or a coronary care unit? Did you know that that originated from the Gemini program in, 19, in the 19, early 1960s? So, the telemetry was done by space labs. Uh, in the US to monitor the humans in space. And then they brought that into the hospital environment. And that was the first in uh, critical care units and the first uh, intensive care units in the late 1960s. So we're benefiting right now from all those, uh, 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 those opportunities that were grasped back in the Gemini and the Apollo program. And now we're into this new era. The next um, thing to do there, we during COVID, we monitored people remotely 
uh, with a bio sticker. So instead of being connected with the wires in your intensive care unit, you now can be connected with a uh, sticker uh, that monitors your temperature 1,600 times a day and your pulse, your position, your movements, and that goes through to your app, and it's a medical-grade sensor, and we did that for monitoring for COVID risk in Antarctica uh, under a research protocol with BioIntelligence and the University of uh, California, San Francisco. So that's the next level from, you know, so people are using that around the world for hospital in the home or dis discharge or step down from coronary care or intensive care or um, uh, you know, cancer treatment uh, centres to have early detection of infection risk or deterioration of patients. This is now being flown on the International Space Station or, or a half of this one smaller. Opportunities for Tasmania, I hopefully have highlighted some of these, but these are just some of the events that are happening in Tasmania in the next four, four or five months. So we've got the Humans in Space Challenges uh, in Exploration course, we've got, uh, which articulates with the UTAS Healthcare and Remote Extreme Environments Unit, Aerospace Medicine Conference uh, in September, followed by the Australian Space Research Conference and then uh, the Akram Rural uh, Medicine Australia Conference. So there is a place, uh, an opportunity for Australia, there is a place uh, for Tasmania, and we need to make the most of the opportunity um, in space medicine and life sciences. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Jeff. I think that's really impressive, amazing stuff, highlighting some of the really important challenges that are often overlooked in like heroic works of science fiction or in really dry kind of technocratic approaches to activity in space. Um, so something, something to think about in terms of multidisciplinarity, knowing the environment, knowing the medical practice, being able to act uh, without a round trip communication to earth every single time. So our final speaker tonight is a computer science and machine learning researcher a generalist technology freelancer and educator who was recently named one of Science and Technology Australia's superstars of STEM for 2023 and 24. With a background in computer science and software development, Mars Butfield Addison works with universities and with companies to develop software for space-related instrumentation, so things that are used across astronomy, space weather modeling, uh, space debris and asteroid tracking, and many more. She's currently doing a PhD in computer engineering at the University of Tasmania and CSIRO, where she adapts radio telescopes for spacecraft and space debris tracking. Please welcome Mars Butfield Addison. Good evening, everyone. I would also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional and continued owners and custodians of our land, the Muwanina and Palawa people. And it's especially relevant as we talk today about issues of people trying to claim sovereignty over things that should be ours or for everyone or for no one. I would also like to thank the organizers of the event. I myself watched quite a few of these Island of Ideas talks while in lockdown, and they've been a great resource. Uh, I'm Mars, and I think you will notice quite quickly I may be less of a professor than the others, but I make things. I love tinkering, I love building, I love making things, and I have a bunch of different jobs where I make things and help people learn how to make things. I love pulling things apart. I love sticky problems that exist at kind of the intersection of these like social problems and historical problems where we do these things because that's the way we always did it or these kind of technical problems but came about for really human reasons and space is one of those domains where it's just really gritty messy stuff. My day job at the university is I do, I work with software for telescopes, things like this lad here, it's a large multi-telescope interferometer from the northern New South Wales, it belongs to CSIRO. I also get to work on some of the awesome UTAS telescopes. If you're from a certain part of the internet, you would know me as the silly goose who's trying to self-fund building my own science center in Strawn. Cross your fingers for me. <laughs> uh, I'm here today to talk to you about space debris, but because I knew I'd be following the fantastic Simon Ellingson and that he probably would have told you a little bit about it, I thought, well, now I'm gonna have to be bad cop. And I'm gonna be the person that has to talk about the problems because yes, Tasmania is doing some fantastic things. We're really contributing to solving this problem, but okay, we're doing this awesome stuff about trying to address the problem, but so what? Is this gonna get us there? How did the problem come about? And so I had a few key questions that I thought would remain at this point. Where does space debris come from? Why can't we just get rid of it all at once? And what could go wrong if we don't? And throughout this whole talk, you're gonna hear this persistent theme. We should think of a sp space domain as a domain of conservation, like we do our skies, like we do our oceans, like we do our waterways, our forests. 
the space domain is one for conservation. So begin with where did it come from? Very topical. I've chosen an image of the ocean because we're kind of asking a similar question. Like if you were going to ask, how did they get so much plastic in the ocean? The answer you don't want is, oh, well, people put it there. The answer you want is looking at those sticky problems, those social influences, those systematic processes that led to plastic ending up in the ocean. We don't want to know how one plastic bottle ended up in the ocean. We want to know why all of them started ending up in the ocean at once. And it starts at the very beginning. There's this fun anecdote where the very first satellite most people know is Sputnik, this little orb, launched by the Soviet Union in 1957. But actually, when we talk about satellite tracking, which is the method of keeping track of where these things are in space and making sure they don't end up as debris or don't crash into each other and create debris, has been wrong from the start. So in 1957, the US and the Soviet Union were working on launching artificial satellites, our first ones in the world. And they were doing this under the guise of scientific exploration. They were in the midst of the Cold War and they didn't want to aggravate each other and have each other thinking we were putting up something in the skies to spy on them. So they came up with this International Geophysical Year. We're going to call this entire year a year for science and everyone's going to do all these different projects that are how we can learn about the Earth. And some of the things we're going to do are we're going to put spy things in space. And so each of these different countries got to work, trying to do their different projects and keeping it secret from each other. But to make it so that it wasn't a hostile act, we got the different scientists into different rooms together and they had quiet talks with each other about what their countries were doing. In Barcelona in 1956, they had a summit of some of the scientists responsible for the satellite programs from the US and the USSR put into a room together and they agreed upon the frequency that these things would transmit. The satellites that they were first put into space would transmit down their signal back to Earth at 108 megahertz. And a year later, when they launched Sputnik, in fact, just before the launch, they even had a meeting about it so that the scientists from the USSR could come in and proudly say, yes, we're about to put up a satellite. We won't tell you when, but it's going to be transmitting at 20 and 40 megahertz. So the US had spent a year building base stations that could track satellites in space all the way down the meridian that runs from the east coast of US to the west of South America. And none of them could see it. <laughs> Couldn't see the first thing we put in space. How are we going to see all the things we put in space now? Then you get up to things like we had early years of maybe ignorance, but we learned very quickly that space debris would be a problem. You've probably heard of Kessler syndrome if you've seen the movie Gravity. And this is what we call the phenomena if there are so many things in Earth orbit that they start to crash into each other or cluster or swarm in a way that we wouldn't be able to get things through it. We wouldn't be able to launch things into it. And space would become effectively non-functional in that particular regime of orbit. This is a paper in which that scientist, Donald Kessler, who was not actually responsible for calling it the Kessler syndrome, that was one of his colleagues, uh, came up with the idea when he was studying the ways that asteroid belts form. The way that asteroid belts form, uh, we have these large rocks that continually bump into each other, creating smaller rocks, which bunch, bump into other ones, which create smaller rocks, and they create this partic particular distribution. And he theorized that we would be able to see this if we kept putting satellites in space, we'd start to have the same collision risk and then distribution of debris that would cause accelerated collisions and additional collision risk among our artificial satellites, 1970s. Then there are cases where we had just bad designs. This is a certain type of satellite used by an ocean and atmospheric research institute from the US, and they've had 19 of these. And in like the 1980s, they already had some of these breaking apart or like their battery pack would fail when they were launched. And so a few months later, bits of it would break off. Now in like the last five years, two of them have just spontaneously broken into pieces and they still keep launching the same design of satellite. They're like, nothing hit it. It just broke apart into pieces. We'll launch another one instead, just replace it. That's fine, keep going. Then we have, get to the early 2000s and we start to go, okay, well, people aren't gonna stop putting debris in space by themselves. We better start making some rules. Places like the European Space Agency started making rules like, okay, we're going to have this retirement idea. Once your satellite stops being functional, you're going to move it out to graveyard orbit or bring it down if it's in low orbit. Then they did a study a few years later and they found that of all the people that they had made part of this program and made agree to follow these rules, a third of them did it properly, a third of them didn't do it properly enough so it was basically useless, and a third of them just ignored it. When we get to... 2009, which was one of the largest debris forming events in Earth's history, I think the largest debris forming event in Earth's history, the Chinese anti-satellite weapon test. In 2009, one of these truck mounted kinetic kill missiles, this isn't the exact one, it's very hard to find photos of it, uh, shot down one of China's own satellites and broke it into over 2000 pieces of debris. 
And everyone went, oh my gosh. And like in, two, in 2020, I believe, yes, uh, Russia also shot down one of their own satellites. In the intervening years, India had shot down one of their satellites. And every time the US went, oh, my goodness, even though the US has actually been doing it since the 1970s, they started by flying fighter planes straight up with missiles mounted on the bottom that they would then shoot up into orbit to blow things out. Then there were those experiments where they just decided to nuke the upper atmosphere on the idea that then they wouldn't have to hit a satellite directly, they'd just be able to EMP it out of the sky. They also then did their own anti-satellite test that looked exactly like this in 2008 and said that didn't count because one of their satellites was at risk of falling on someone but other people shouldn't do it. <laughs> now we have places where we get into the era of commercial space flight. And like Simon has said, now it's very easy for a private company with a few hundred thousand dollars to rent a spot for a set amount of kilos on a private launch company's rocket to say, I want this amount of space. It's gonna weigh this amount. I'll pay you this amount to put our thing into space. You get to put it on your website that you have space-based infrastructure. Customers love that. Then you get to just complete disregard. All of a sudden, money is involved. You can make so much money off the idea that you have infrastructure in orbit. This is an example from a company called Swarm Technologies in uh, San Francisco, who came up with the idea that they would make these little tiny satellites called the Space Bee, because we don't have very good rules to try and prevent space debris. The body in the US that's mostly responsible for trying to stop people putting crap into orbit is the FCC. And the FCC said, no, this thing is too small. It's going to be too hard for us to track. It's just going to be basically debris. We won't be able to stop it from hitting anything. You can't put it into space. So I paid an Indian launch company to put four of them into space anyway. The FCC slapped them on the hand with a $900,000 fine and then gave them the approval for the next three they want to launch immediately. They want to put 100 of them in space. So you can see that as we go on, people get more excited by the idea, less less attention paid to the problem. People saying that Starlink satellites are going to change the world. And yes, there are issues of the digital divide and of how we're going to get connectivity to remote areas. And it might be a very privileged position to say, maybe we don't need these, but we do know what they could cost us. So one interpretation of how it got there is on the part of some people, it is persistent and willful in action for decades. It's not ignorance. It's not, we didn't know debris would be an issue. It's there's a lot of money to be made for this, and everyone wants to be part of the problem in that putting things in space and making a lot of money for it. And no one wants to be part of the solution. There are very few places like the University of Tasmania that contribute to tracking things in space, including things up in space, but don't put anything in space of our own. Basically non-existent. There's additional nuance in this issue where we're getting debates around the idea of like, if we make all these strict rules about you can't put things in orbit unless they're going to fit these certain criteria, are going to fulfill these certain tests, going to be low risk for debris, et cetera, we're actually keeping some people out of the race entirely. If there are countries that haven't yet developed their own launch capability, they now have no right to fail. If the first things they ever launch aren't going to be allowed in the sky unless they're as good as the things being developed by countries who have been doing this for 50 years, they might never make it to space, keeping them out of the race. So why can't we just get rid of it? Take a big scoop, get rid of all of it at once. The first answer is there's a lot of it. And the interesting part, if you look at pictures like this, is they kind of distribute in these interesting ways. It's not like we just have this big swamp. Yes, somewhat, it's just a big blob of dots. But if you look very closely, you'll see that there's kind of patterns in these dots. The parts of space and these particular what we call orbit regimes that we put satellites in correspond to their purpose. When we have satellites that need to track where you are on the Earth's surface, they're out in that outer ring because they need to stay in a very stable orbit relative to Earth. If you're having one that's going to be responsible for your phone calls, you want the signal travel time out and back to be as short as possible, you want that thing to be very close to Earth. Or if you want something to orbit in a way that it spends more time over a particular part of the Earth or sees certain parts of the Earth, like Earth observation satellites that Simon mentioned, you're going to put them in orbits that are uneven around Earth or that loop the poles so that they see everything. And so it's not even that we've got so many things in space. We've got so many things in space, each fighting for the same tiny parts of space. And there are lots of ideas about how we can get things down out of space. Things like these grabber hands or pinning a sail to it that will add drag, that will make it slow down and fall down on its own. There are even these interesting ideas like space brooms. This is an example of a satellite satellite space broom, usually the ground based, where it's a laser that you use to add force to slow something down so it will fall out of the sky. But 
That's kind of like coming up with an idea where you're going to solve the problem of traffic by removing every car from the road, which from that context, maybe we should, but in the sky, not, not as feasible. So regardless of our debris management practices, regardless of the technologies we develop to get these things out of the sky, even if we got past the idea that they're doing it one at a time, and that's going to take a really long time, but if we do that better, we still need space traffic management. For the same reason as if there's more than one plane in the sky, you still need air traffic control. If there's more than one satellite in space, we still need space traffic management. Which is why I work on some really awesome projects that I hope so will ask about at places like the University of Tasmania. I got more pictures of the fantastic Mount Pleasant. I think it's fantastic. I could look at this picture all day where we look at how we can make systems that will observe satellites while the satellite is, while the telescope, sorry, is doing other things. So we can keep track of the skies over Tasmania and out to really far distances because we've got a great view from down here on the bottom of the planet, places that not many land masses can see of where these things are. And we can report that information back to people who are operating these satellites from anywhere on the globe. Here's another one from the sky of Bizdi Tia. Thought it was a fantastic photograph. Uh, there are a number of people here working at UTAS who work on all different aspects of how we can better track satellites in low Earth orbit, or even all the way up to orbiters that are around other planets in the solar system and how we can use the signals that they send back to tell us different things about solar weather that might impact the orbit of satellites near us on Earth. Because it turns out that as the sun is spewing things out, it's actually changing how the satellites around us are moving, how fast they can go, how much drag is being imparted on them. So all these chaotic factors that we don't know half of what we need to about, that we somehow need to account for. It's an impossibly large task. So what could go wrong if we don't? Well, it's not like if we don't have email or messaging anymore, we can just go back to sending letters to one another, as sweet as that is. It's not like if we don't have the internet anymore, we can all go back to snuggling under a rug on the couch and watching an old television set that's transmitted from somewhere up the road and some guy called Bill gives you a show about fishing in the evenings. It's not like we can go back to pulling over every five minutes and reading the damn street directory. Does anyone remember what a refidex is? When you tell that to children, they're amazed. You'd have to stop all the time and remember where you are. Yes, children, yes, we did. It's not like if we didn't have precision and central managed time, we could go back to winding our watches and keeping track of that on our own. It's not like if we didn't have ways to monitor weather, we could go back to looking lovingly at the sky and guessing and then asking your neighbor who thinks he's got a feel for this kind of thing. In the same way as getting satellites in the first place represented a huge dramatic change to our way of life in the way that we socially evolved to interact with each other, expect this rapid communication, and we made precision instruments and logistical processes that rely on this information in every part of our lives. If they stopped working, all that change would be undone like that. And I don't want to freak you out. It's not like the, that's all going to go wrong tomorrow. But it is the case that over a decade or two decades, this could happen. Some of the worst models have it happening from the early the, sorry, mid-2030s to mid-2040s, if it's already begun, which we have no way to tell, really. What happens to the planes that are in the sky and the ships in the middle of the ocean and all of those precision instruments trying to do telehealth operations on each other? Or just the way that we see each other, speak to each other? Your relatives in other countries, maybe it would feel like we were all in lockdown again. So I encourage you that in the same way, that we think of people all over the world who are fighting for our forests and our waterways and our land to, in the same way, give much thought to the conservation of our skies. Here's how you can keep up with me if you would like to, or how you can follow the fantastic space scientists, my group at UTES. Thank you. Thanks, Mars. I think that's actually the perfect way to end the presentation section of the evening, uh, highlighting the technical complexity involved in sustainably cooperatively using space for the benefit of everyone and the need to forward plan to preserve limited resources is a really critical point and i think especially those who are still in school still learning uh can take that as an inspiration of challenges to uh to uh try to overcome or to deal with for those in the policy making and planning phase of their careers probably a cautionary tale something to keep in mind that's a really fantastic wrap up uh and i think um, it kind of emphasizes the analogs between you know, the challenges of resourcing a global population on the surface of the earth 
and what it means to inhabit islands that are in the sky. So I think um, now we should probably uh, open the floor to discussions. Hey guys, uh, just a question directed at Mars, but uh, open to the panel. Um, what effect is the space debris having on, I guess, Earth? It, does it have any potential to slow the rotation, tilt, uh, change any of our proximity to the sun? How can it actually affect, I guess, our environment and our weather patterns having so much debris up there, if any? Oh, I, I, this might be an astrophysicist question, but yeah, well, I do know that... We need, a, we need a climate scientist up here, but maybe Simon has uh, the most direct uh, things experience. Going through the atmosphere does impact it. So I've seen some great talks from other scientists who do work in this space that say things like rocket launches going through our ionosphere creates these waves that we can observe by looking at the inaccuracy on our GPS. So if you're starting to see that little circle get bigger around you and you're in a location where you previously used to be very well tracked, it's probably an indication there's something going on in the ionosphere. That can be things like aurora, but it can also be something disturbing it. That's the extent of my knowledge. Go ahead, Simon. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's an effect, but it's one that's small compared to other ones, I would say. So there's a lot of stuff up there, but most of it's pretty small. So the covering factor and things like that are very small. So the things that actually affect the Earth's orbit are actually much more stuff that happens here on the ground. So it's things like melting ice sheets, it's things like earthquakes and things like that. So the sort of effects you're talking about would exist, but they'd be you know very small compared to those. So that's probably one of the things we don't need to worry about too much for the moment, so yes. We have a great question online, and I think it could be applicable to any one of the panelists because it's just so open-ended and cool. Which is a question from Cindy who asks, what happens with fire in space? A good question. Uh, for Obviously, it could be devastating for the humans, on, and it certainly has been uh, in the confines of the space station. Um, which is you know, maybe of uh, high levels of oxygen and other, uh, and also has a whole lot of other potential toxic uh, materials in there, metals and things like that. So a fire inside of the space station would be devastating, uh, and and in Antarctica would be devastating. Um, but a fire outside of in space is Simon's. Yeah, we'll leave that to the chemists. But I mean, fires essentially require oxygen. And one thing there isn't a lot of, unless you happen to be in a human habitation, is, is much oxygen. So I think when we see um, Hollywood or other movie depictions of what goes on in space, there's a, a good chunk of artistic license in that. Things can explode. But um, yeah, fires and things like that are probably mainly um, an issue for a human habitation, where, of course, yeah, that could be devastating. I was watching a sci-fi film the other day and in the first scene they had a scene where the computer said that the oxygen level was going up and up and up to 100% and everyone in the room who were scientists went, ooh. <laughs> this is maybe a question for Jeff, but in terms of telehealth, um, when you're communicating with an astronaut on the moon, there's a couple of seconds delay and if you're talking about Mars rovers, then there's 20 to 40 minute delay. Do you have any, oh, you've got a lot of years to think about it, but do you have any idea of what that would mean for delivering critical health to astronauts? Yeah, excellent question. So, and that's why space agencies like NASA have been working with us because up until five or six years ago, I was working, doing telehealth over 28 kilobits per second, which is dial up speed. So the things that I've, the systems that have been developed by my predecessor and all my colleagues out at Kingston, the IT team, ICT team have been, um, able to work offline and online and uh, and the the ultrasound project that I implemented in 2012 uh, that was a store and forward uh, system so that is why they're uh, looking at us because we are experts at working with high latency um, and in Antarctica we only, we have latency up to 600 milliseconds each way and so we're down on the poles there's very few polar satellites uh, and so we have to look to the uh, equator and the equator is just above the horizon and it's quite difficult to get there and but there's latency and we and yeah but we've got more bandwidth now but if someone can solve the latency problem which is a physics problem um, then that, that'll be very rich uh, but 
going to Mars, it could be eight minutes or 45 minutes. So when people say, why aren't you doing remote telesurgery on the way to Mars? Um, I would say, well, you know, latency, you know, if you have your cardiac arrest and you tell the robot to, to start working, it might be 20 minutes later. And so, uh, you know, that is why autonomous procedures and aut uh, autonomy is important. And uh, having a generalist doctor or trained crew medical officer to provide on-site um, support and decision analytics, all these things, uh, artificial intelligence, decision analytics, autonomous procedures, you know, some robotics that actually work on the, the vehicle itself um, without reference to earth is what's going to be needed where there's high latency. Um, but we, that's what we've been doing for decades where you know, we haven't had the communication. So we, out of necessity, we've had to do uh, telehealth via that. And that also then applies to remote Australia where you know, we haven't got the connectivity until more recently with Starlink and those sort of things um, where video calls don't work and you know, out of necessity, it all happened in COVID whilst um, uh, you were all in lockdown. You know, telehealth was opened up, whereas before it was all shut down um, by the, the you know, out of necessity, we make things work. In Antarctica, out of necessity, we make things work. And then I ask, well, why can't we do it in remote Australia? Yeah, um, the speed of light is one of those inconvenient truths which... Um causes this latency and which is also often ignored in science fiction but um yeah i don't it'll be a significant breakthrough if we can solve some of those problems like that that's great we've, we've got just a wide diversity of questions from online and i'd like to take one uh, about regulatory frameworks from wg online um Probably maybe start with mars uh, are there any moves to upgrade the various un space law treaties in order to cope with people who may not uh, may not be uh, thrilled about following rules, there actually is the UN Office of Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, and they've done great work in space policy. And we've got even people at UTAS who are interested in space law and space policy. There's quite a lot going on, uh, but it's one of those difficult things because it's much like the Antarctic Treaty, maybe the the greatest international treaty that we've ever managed to maintain. When we're talking about the commons, and there, if you ever look up that term, the commons refers to parts of law that enshrine resources that affect everyone. And so we have these ideas of you know, the ocean. The ocean might be something that only certain countries are attached to, but if one country makes it unusable, then basically all of us are affected. And we have these laws that enshrine these commons, whatever those resources are, you know, the, the air, if one country makes copious amounts of air pollution, we're all going to suffer that. And those are really important because they, they really make it clear, like we're all in this together. And space is another one of those domains that we need to see as the commons. It's something that one person can stuff up and that will impact everyone. And so there are great strides in trying to apply laws that impact things like the oceans and Antarctica and shared spaces to space. But it's just... So much money to be made and a country can just say i don't want to agree to it and they don't have to there's not much you can do to force a country to agree to something if they don't want to and especially when each of those countries has to think about what benefits themselves so when we get back to the ideas like the right to fail it would make sense if certain countries were saying why aren't i allowed to do my first launch when they're doing their 400 million one opportunity for Tasmania is in the Antarctic Treaty. So there's experts here in Tasmania who are experts in the Antarctic Treaty. The Antarctic Treaty meeting was last week in Helsinki and our, our, our team went uh, over to that. But that the Antarctic Treaty was the model for the Space Treaty uh, where there was shared scientific information, peaceful purposes is in, in the Antarctic Treaty. and uh, No ownership. No ownership and and uh, just uh, so that model was then used for the space treaty. They didn't put the peaceful purposes in there, I don't think, but um, uh, that is the model. And there's experts here in Tasmania who could inform that debate and, and that policy um, correlation. Um, this is a little out of left field and probably for the entire panel. Um, just I know you touched on AI and I was just wondering 
where you could see that working in your particular expertise? Like, is there a space for a, a you know, a space Roomba that can go around and recognise things and that sort of thing? If you were going to put it into one area, where do you think you might see it emerging? I can take this question. So previously I used to work with AI. I can make AI. It's an area that I know a lot about. Um, actually, the first avenue I was going to take in my PhD was looking at how AI could be applied to this space. And it's interesting because when we look at things like orbital models, they're chaotic. And the fundamental truth of AI is it looks at ways to find patterns, simplify distilled patterns in what it's seen before, and apply that to the future, which means it's great for things that are going to continue being kind of the same. So that's not great in things like propagation models or trying to identify where things are in space because of those chaotic, chaotic effects. But if it were for say an autonomous in space robot that was going around to try and where the AI would be to recognize something and to plot a trajectory to it and to figure out how to grab it, then yes, it would probably be great. Again, you'd run up into that problem where it's quite costly to operate and it's probably gonna bring down one object in its lifetime. We'll probably have to come down with it. Uh, so the feasibility from other aspects is really difficult. Uh, otherwise, there are certain areas where you can apply AI. This is a weird one. So when you talk about how like this, the sci-fi doesn't do very well with the speed of light transmission problem, it's interesting because it makes me think that some of the sci-fi that I read has this idea that's quite like in video games, if you're playing a video game online and you're running in a certain direction and your internet hiccups for a bit, the person you're playing with is going to see you keep running in that direction. And then if your internet goes back and you actually change direction, all of a sudden they'll see you kind of teleport to where you were going. And this phenomenon is called lag compensation. It's trying to account for the fact that the other person expects to see you with greater latency than they can manage given the transmission time. So what they do is they try to think ahead to what you will be doing and show that person that. And then if it was wrong, it kind of backpedals a bit. And in sci-fi, you hear some things about transmissions. If you're going to say something that's kind of easy to assume what you're going to say, then you could have fast and light comms that's just like speaking for you and then updating if it was wrong, which is not a good use. You shouldn't do it for that. But there are probably cases where you could use that kind of lag compensation to account for things like really tiny anomalies, like dropped packets in transmissions and stuff. So yeah, low level logistics and object recognition and light autonomy of robots, yes accounting for messy human things and the chaos of stellar physics, not so much. <laughs> Thanks, I think um, we're probably just running a little bit short on time now, um, but the last couple of questions have shown that there's a real appetite to learn about uh, rights and responsibilities and um, really making space accessible and sustainable for all. And so I'd like to encourage everyone to uh, uh, subscribe to the updates and there'll be another space talk in the Island of Ideas in September on the 26th, which will focus on exactly that subject. So um, yeah, stay tuned, uh, keep watching the skies. Um, I hope the discussions that have been kicked off will continue informally between all audience members and that new conversations get started between uh, friends and family members around the dinner table, around the water cooler. It's obvious that um, We've only just been able to scratch the surface here tonight. And um, I think the really strong response is a really hopeful sign for how things are going to go in the future. So please uh, thank me, uh, join me in thanking all of our speakers tonight, uh, Simon Ellingson, uh, Jeff Hayden, and Mars Budfield Addison. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, the next talk in this series uh, will be on uh, the voice to truth, a voice for generations on the 26th of July. So um, please join us for that conversation. Thank you.